an uh, incredible journey to go from having no wolves there at all uh, to uh, being part of the wolf restoration efforts to bring them back. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to come today and to share those experiences with you. And, and what we're hoping is that some of what we've learned with wolves can be applied here to help reduce conflicts between dingo and livestock operators um, in the ways perhaps some of the things that we can learn from while we're here that we can take back with us that can help us better approach uh, these conflict management situations back at home. So we're hoping to learn from each other. And even though the situations may differ broadly, the wolf is the ancestor of the dingo. Uh, and in some cases, all of these tools may overlap, or at least we're hoping that they will. Um, I'd like to thank the sponsors who made our trip possible. And that includes the Humane Society International from Australia, and there you are. And the Blue Mountains Her or, or, excuse me, Blue Mountains World Heritage Institute. I'm a little jet lag. Um, and the Center for uh, Cash Compassionate Conservation. Um, so originally, the the gray wolf was one of the world's most widely distributed mammal. It was eradicated from much of the Western Europe and Mexico, almost all of the USA. Their present um, distribution is more restricted. They primarily occurred in our country, in the uh, USA, continental USA. In the 1930s, um, they had ranged across the country up until that period of time, until uh, about the 1930s when they were almost completely eradicated. We were down to about 200 wolves left in the country, uh, state of uh, Minnesota at that time. By the 1970s, when the ESA was first created, the Endangered Species Act, which was the first major legislation that protected endangered species or rare and threatened species in our country, um, wolves were virtually gone. Uh, they were the, one of the first species that was listed for protection under the ESA uh, in 1974. And that's when efforts really started to, to uh, determine how to restore wolves in parts of the country where their habitat still existed. It took a, quite a long time of, of working on that. In fact, it actually took an act of Congress to approve the, the introduction of wolves. So in 1995 and 1996, we uh, went to Canada, scooped up 66 wolves, took about half of them to Idaho and released them there, and the other half to Yellowstone National Park. Uh, the, the, the goal was to create a meta population of wolves, so we wanted to see that um, there, there would be at least core, sub core populations um, of wolves, both in Montana and as well as other parts of the Rockies. Yellowstone and Idaho were the two areas where they had the largest habitat to bring wolves back. At one time, there had been about 400,000 wolves in our country, uh, potentially more, uh, but through poisoning, trapping, um, that was pretty much how they got rid of all of them. So the, when we restored wolves, we were bringing them into a generation of people that had never, ever lived with them before. And even though tens of thousands of livestock die annually in the region due to all kinds of causes, um, the wolf became pretty much the most uh, blamed scapegoat when we brought the wolf back. People hadn't lived with them for generations. They all grew up with fairy tales, much like most of us. Um, that were very negatively portrayed wolves, the Little Red Riding Hood, the Bad Wolf, um, Peter and the Wolf, there's all kinds. But because of that, people had no idea how to live with them anymore. They were very afraid of them. I had no way of being able to determine or detect between what it was natural predation or natural causes of livestock losses and, and wolves. Um, they thought just because wolves are in the area, it automatically meant that even the animals that they recognize as normally dying for other causes, uh, they thought somehow wolves had a, a role in that. Um, it made it very difficult for the, for the land managers at the time, and the wildlife managers. Uh, rural communities really responded by uh, expressing a great deal of anger toward the government. They felt betrayed. Um, they were already concerned or, or resistant uh, to government interference because of regulatory restrictions on things like grazing lands or timber harvest situations. Um, so it became more of a kind of a rural community outcry um, that bringing wolves back suddenly um, had been an invasion of their rights and uh, there were 
a great deal of people that started to motivate or to, uh, to act against them. And the Fish and Wildlife Service, which is the core agency for bringing wolves back, had covered all the bases in terms of how you actually mechanically do the wolf reintroduction. What they hadn't done is really cover the social bases, uh, the conflicts uh, that would have provided a better foundation for wolves being on the ground and living with their new neighbors. These are just two of the posters that I found near our home um, in the community that, that we grew up um, worked in. Uh, I'm from Idaho. Uh, it's in the northern Rockies. It's one of the most conservative states in the region. And uh, this was not uncommon to see stuff like this, along with things like bumper stickers, that sort of thing. People bragging about killing wolves illegally. Uh, people threatening. We've had, I don't know, um, things like uh, threatening letters or emails or phone calls, we've had bullets go right over the top of our heads in certain circumstances. And you know, it's been a pretty difficult environment to bring this uh, species back, in, back into. But they did. Um, the wolf reintroduction biologically was very successful. And uh, wolves started expanding out beyond their range, um, which is where they incurred more and more conflicts. Since that time of the wolf reintroduction, which was in the, 19, the 1990s, We've lost over 2,000 wolves in response to livestock conflicts in the western United States. Uh, that's more than more wolves than we have out there uh, in the population right now. Okay. Uh, in the western United States, wolves kill more sheep than they do any other type of livestock. And as a result, Wyoming, the entire state of Wyoming, decided that they were going to create a virtually no wolf zone. So you can kill wolves there anytime, yeah, for any reason, uh, by anyone. And, in, and that's around about 85% of the state. In Idaho, uh, the wolf population, since the federal protection has been removed, has dropped from, a, from about 1,000 wolves to about 500 to 600 wolves in just the last three years. This is all motivated by livestock protection. There's really no other uh, conflicts that are going on beyond that at any level. Now, that's the bigger picture of what's going on around us. Um, I'm in central Idaho, and in an area where some of the highest concentration of wolves on the landscape, and also some of the biggest concentration of livestock on the landscape exist. It's kind of ground zero for wolves. And this is a, an area where uh, the wolves were first released um, during the wolf reintroduction. So here we are um, in our community, and we've got a new pack of wolves that have moved in into the Sawtooth Valley. And it's called the Phantom Hill Pack. That's the name of the hill that's back behind these wolves right now. And they denned close to the highway there. Pretty soon, quite a few people were starting to come out and watch them. People that come from all over the world to go watch wolves over in Yellowstone National Park. One of the biggest tourism industries in our entire region it brings in over 35 million dollars a year. Um, suddenly, people in our neighborhood had wolves that they could go watch. It didn't cost them anything. They could uh, take their car down to the highway and sit off the side, and they had a mini Yellowstone going on. And they started putting some value to these animals being out there. They got to know the names. They gave names to the pups. Um, they they were trading back and forth on you know what kinds of activities the wolves had been up to. They became personal to them. And that was until about June that year when about 2,000 sheep started moving up into the area. They did. And uh, we, as they were coming in, the wolves killed about I think, eight, nine, ten sheep. Um, and the normal reaction to that would have been to just kill the wolves. That's, that's pretty much the, the go-to position. But what we found working in that valley is that because people cared about the wolves, they started speaking out to their local officials. They demanded that the wolves not be killed. Um, they asked us to come in to the Center for Wildlife and try some of the non-lethal tools that we had been working with on other ranches. We'd only done it on a few other ranches on an individual basis in the past before this project. This was a much bigger landscape. Um, this was uh, including much, a great part, portion of a, a national forest, um, but more more importantly, um, it was an area that had both public and private land, so there's a pretty massive range going on here. In this picture in particular, uh, this was just about a week, uh, three or four days after the first uh, depredation occurred. We came in with these 
uh, what they call Flavri, which is a, a tool that came to us from Europe, um, Eastern Europe, out of Poland. Um, I've got a, a sample of it up here. And um, my graduate advisor, Marco Mussiani from the University of Calgary, had taken this out of Poland and seen it used over there. And what, what they had done in the past was for generations, they would take pieces of old clothing and they would strike it out on a line in a huge V. And the villagers would come through the forest and they'd bang on pots and pans and they'd, they'd haze the wolves into the, the wide portion of this V. And the wolves would run in and wouldn't go underneath the flattery. They would go to their demolies at the end of the V, at the funnel, where the hunters would wait to kill them. Uh, my professor had seen this and thought, what an interesting tool. Why couldn't we then use this as a non-lethal tool to just keep the <coughs> out of getting into the livestock? Um, so that's what you're seeing right here as we change it from kind of a more informal type of tool into something that's a little bit more regulated. We also put uh, solar charge to it so that it has an electrical charge, can be moved out in the field pretty much any time. The sheep stay in behind the flattery boundary. Um, the wolves have avoided it substantially. We, we tested it in um, captivity first, putting um, the uh, lower ranking members of a pack on one side with the food, and the higher ranking members of the pack on the other side, um, which normally they get to eat first, um, and they wouldn't cross the flattery. So we thought, okay, if it works in captivity, let's try it out in the field. Um, and we've been using this stuff ever since. We put it around nine mile, miles of a ranch up near Salmon, Idaho. It was the first major test of it anywhere in the world. And uh, the wolves, uh, just don't hold oh, you bet, yeah, you bet, you can pass around and still walk up. You don't, um, don't rub your hands on that stuff. It's a little bit of a left thread through there. Can you get a little bit of left in Oh, sure. Uh, yeah, I don't, I want to overbear you guys here, but it's not a whisper. Okay. Sure, yeah, you go yeah. for it. Just don't try to tangle it. Do you guys want to hold it or are you okay? You can see it's a plastic thing on a bit of white. <laughs> <laughs> Very technical. It's red. <laughs> you held one and you can't see it. There you go. Long story short, um, these wolves were in the same meadow. They're right behind here in a den site in this picture. And they shared the meadow then with the sheep for the rest of the summer. Um, yeah, and they went up into the mountains after that. The dense site's about, uh, about a couple of hundred meters away from here. But uh, we had no more losses of uh, uh, sheep after that. And everybody thought, well, okay, we, we dodged a bullet on that one. Let's, let's see if we can do it again. So we, it. Okay. we had our, our skeptics, of course. Uh, people look at this the same way that you just did. You think it looks probably better to maybe around a used car parking lot or something like that. but. Uh, uh, we, we definitely had people within the community who thought there's not a chance this stuff's going to work. Um, You're off the mic again. No, no, she, but she's at least not popping. Okay. <laughs> no. I don't Sorry, want to we are, we are trying. I, just, I can't get it to in between. Not to be completely yeah. I'll, try, I'll try to find a balance here. Let's see if it works. All right. I can see this too. We had wolf managers, ranchers insisting that there really, really was nothing left to do to kill the, except for to kill wolves, um, which is what they had been doing all along. Uh, but once they gave us a chance to try this project out and to see if the flag would work, and we were successful, um, they decided to go ahead. And it really was because of one rancher. Uh, ranchers pretty much had the say of things in our part of the region. Uh, we had one rancher that was willing to try it. He was open-minded. They had decided to start their business um, being what they considered wildlife friendly. Um, so they then um, convinced their neighbors, uh, the neighboring ranchers, that if they were willing to try it and it was working successfully, um, that others should try it as well. And that's what really gave birth to the Wood River Wolf Project. And this is where Brad and I met, because he came out a few years ago to look at our project on the ground. Uh, we've been working on this project now since for the last six years, we just finished our sixth field season. Uh, it's a pretty basic model. We have uh, uh, ranchers, uh, affected stakeholders, agencies working collaboratively together to discuss our concerns and to find ways to address the conflicts. Uh, it's really important that communication takes place 
in person, and typically one-on-one -on -one or in small groups like this. We also had to kind of check our disagreements at the door. Uh, the ranchers in our community, uh, their original foundation belief about wolves was that they, it was, it was good to get rid of them. We should never have them back. They didn't want to have them back at all. Basically, it was hell no wolves. We don't want them here. And so we had to agree among all of our stakeholder members that those bigger picture disagreements could be left outside the door. That we were basically, our goal was to come together to resolve the conflicts and, and as much as we could. So we, we set about and set up our project goal of utilizing and testing non-legal tools and techniques to reduce the livestock and wolf losses and to promote coexistence. We hired field technicians and trained them on how to monitor wolf and uh, livestock activity. Uh, our project area started off at 120 square miles and uh, eventually grew to about over a thousand to convert that farm. We lost all of the radio collar wolves in the first hunting season. Um, so we had to do things like um, really rely on things like tracking, monitoring, looking for scat. We use wildlife cameras now more than anything else. Uh, we found out later that the hunters had been using the radio collars from the wolves, which is um, how they were tracking and killing them. <laughs> so we've gone to cameras now, and uh, we use a lot of cameras. This year we had about three dozen cameras in our project area. This picture um, is the, the sheep on the top and the wolf on the bottom was, was when, within 48 hours of each other being in exactly the same spot. So we've been able to monitor that uh, the wolves are out there and what we're trying to do is to be able to, to show when, which of these tools that we're using are effective. The herders have been instrumental to our projects. They, they know the area much better than any of the rest of us do. So we consider them to be one of our most important project partners, which means we've been hiring bilingual field technicians to make sure that we have good communication with the herders, and then teaching them how to use the non-lethal deterrents that we're putting out in play. There's a wide range of them, and I'll show, me, show you those in just a few moments. Um, but their buy was probably the most crucial out of everyone's. These are some of the tools that we use. Um, they're everything from the cracker shells you can see on the left here. Actually, does this have a point on it too? No. Yeah. Oh, good. Okay. These are cracker shells up here. They kind of go off like a big firework. Um, the fireworks here. Uh, this is the wolf radio collar, the monitoring device for it, tracking device. This is a like a um, racetrack pop gun, pop gun. So it's just a you know noise maker. High beam flash lights. These are extremely, um, they'll go for over like half a mile. It's amazing how far these things will go in the dark here. And then air horns, anything that makes a lot of noise. I've actually scared off a wolf using a pot with a wooden spoon before, so you can do it. Pretty unsophisticated things as well. Wolves are not uh, that uh, aggressive. They're actually very timid of people, so we try to use that part of their nature basically against them. Another thing is the livestock guarding dogs, and guarding dogs are really effective most of the year. Uh, we caution against using them in the springtime because wolves think all dogs are really funny looking wolves. And that's basically what they are, is funny looking wolves. Um, and so in the springtime when wolves are denning and they only den once a year, any strange dog or strange wolf in the area is a distinct threat to their pups. And they will be hyper aggressive and go out and actually try to either kill or scare away that dog in order to protect their pups. Um, so using livestock guarding dogs in the springtime near a wolf den is a train wreck. And that's, you know, if you just knew about the tool, um, sometimes ranchers will use the dogs, have the dogs get injured or killed by wolves and not know that they actually were using it at the wrong time in the wrong place. So very important that all these tools are used effectively uh, when they have their greatest chance of success. Wolves are also scavengers. They'll travel miles and miles to investigate livestock, um, dead livestock, any type of carcasses. Uh, so removing carcasses or putting up some kind of barriers uh, will help reduce that. Um, the bigger the pit, the greater the attraction. And they're just like them. So once they get to a place where they've smelled out some really nasty dead stuff, they'll come in. And if there's a fresh spring lamb there versus this maggoty old 
dead day, they're going to go for the fresh spring layout. They're no different than us in that regard. Uh, and they'll come back and they'll investigate the place where they've gotten uh, scav when they've scavenged something for years after it's already been cleaned up. So uh, making sure that those scavenge files are gone uh, is a really good strategy for reducing livestock conflicts. Our field team is now conducting site analysis evaluations with the ranchers. So we're going out on the grazing allotments with them or on their private ranch lands and helping them assess risk. Uh, I mean, where do they have the greatest chance of, of having predation? And how, what tools would be the most effective and when uh, should they implement those? So after six years of trying these things on the ground, uh, we've had a total of close to about 100,000 sheep in our project area now uh, overall. Um, in that period of time, we've had less than 0.1% livestock losses compared to the area around us. Like we've had fewer than 30 sheep killed overall through that entire period of time over the last six years, um, which is pretty amazing when you compare it with what's going on with the rest of the state. Um, just for example, just the coyotes, and, and coyotes kill more than bulls do, uh, they're probably the most primary predator that, uh, that sheep ranchers encounter. We lose somewhere between five and 10,000 sheep a year to coyotes, usually two, 300 or more sheep a year to wolves. Wolves make the paper there a little bit more controversial. You'll hear more about them. Um, but in our project area, which is this little area here in the center, right there, you can see, um, even though it's the area of the highest concentration of wolves and livestock in that entire region, we've had the fewest depredation losses there. These non-legal tools are working, and they're working really well. So this is our study area. Um, it's in the center of central Idaho, and uh, the green area is where we've expanded into. We're hoping to do it across the entire county. In fact, the county's asked us now to take over. Uh, they're giving the money that they normally had given to the federal government to go in and kill wolves and other predators. They're now giving that money to us to use these non-lethal tools instead. Um, they have asked us to do it at a countywide level, but we have one rancher that has adopted uh, lambing practices that he learned about four or five years ago from New Zealand, where they don't have any predators. And he's now applying those lambing practices out on the open range in Idaho in Blaine County and losing hundreds of sheep every year. Um, he does it by uh, taking several thousand sheep and as they're pregnant, leaving them behind as they give birth, and there'll be pockets of like 10 or 12, 15 sheep with newborn lambs out there um, with no protection. And so coyotes, wolves, everything are going in and killing those sheep. Uh, but our federal government pays for the killing of predators. So he doesn't have to do anything but pick up the phone and call and they can have wolves killed or coyotes or bears or whatever else. So he's our one holdout and we're still working on him. Uh, we're hoping that we're going to recruit him in the next few years, and the community is uh, working on him too. Uh, we're doing a lot of education outreach workshops that help reach new participants, uh, tell them about the type of tools that we're using. One of our best spokespeople is Carter Niemeyer, who's here on your left, and he is uh, used to be a federal agent that was in charge of killing wolves and coyotes and everything else, has come completely around to the other side and is, is promoting the non-lethal tools instead. Uh, as a better method for managing predators. This year we hosted our first regional uh, workshop for, and we expanded beyond wolves to cover wolves, bears, cougars, uh, all the apex predators in our, in our management area. Uh, we covered a, a wide range of different types of non-lethal tools including the flattery and, and some of the other things that we just talked about, the lighting, um, the, the noise makers, uh, livestock guarding dogs real hands-on type of program uh, to, uh, to help people in other states learn from what we're doing on the ground, too. Uh, we had folks there from all over the western United States, uh, actually came all the way from Florida, but we were able, to, thanks to the internet, to be able to do this online, too, so we ended up having participants that joined us from all over the world. Uh, it's amazing how this, these types of methods are taking root in so many different places. Uh, people that were online and were from Israel and Africa and throughout parts of Europe, South America, Australia. Yeah, that was great uh, to be able to share notes with people uh, that are using these techniques everywhere. So what we've discovered is that um, some of our key elements here, that 
the herders and field technicians, basically it's on the ground communication that's the most important, having that one-on-one -on -one communication. Uh, when to use the livestock guarding dogs is extremely important. Removing that dead or dying livestock, um, making sure the livestock are healthy, they're out there. And then monitoring bulls effectively, uh, using the right tools at the right time, good communication, <coughs> and funding. Uh, those are the key elements to making our project successful. Now we're taking this model and adapting it in other places. It's uh, now being used over in Oregon. We've now put it on the ground, working with cattle over in, um, outside of Yellowstone National Park. Um, it's on the ground now in Washington State. So um, some of our responses back, this is from Mike Stevens, who's the president of Lava Lake Land and Livestock, uh, talking about that uh, having grazed advantage sheep, 1,000 sheep for a month, and the immediate daily presence of wolves with no losses of wolves or sheep, and just how outstanding that was, um, and how unusual. And this is from our Blaine County uh, Commissioner, Larry Schoen, who has um, been instrumental in helping to support and promote this program, um, just that it makes sense. I mean, if we can do this using non-lethal tools, and they're smarter, they're more effective, more humane, um, why not? Why not use these tools when they're available to us? Uh, when it, it's such a smarter choice. Our community really values both wildlife as well as the agricultural um, traditions that we have. This last year, uh, it would have surprised us before, but we were able to actually march with our Wood River Wolf um, team out alongside the sheep. We escort them through town. We bring them all through town. Um, so uh, it was quite a celebration, and we got to take part in it. Um, so you can't have both. You can coach this. Our um, booklet is online. It's uh, Wolves and Livestock. And uh, we have the guide translated into Spanish so that we can get it out there to more people. But you can Google for that if you'd like to learn more about it. Uh, and we pulled that book together with using the advice of ranchers um, as well as of our the herding partners that we have too. Our wolf population, despite the fact that so many of them are being killed with non lethal, or excuse me, with lethal control. Um, and that non-lethal is not prevalent across the landscape yet, is still expanding. And yet it also means that as it expands, more and more conflicts are happening. And the social tension over wolves is growing tremendously. Um, it's become an incredibly divisive political battle. And we're hoping that these tools help resolve some of those issues as well. We certainly do within our community. And if our community can be a model for the, for the region, we definitely want it to be. Uh, we're working in cattle operations uh, just outside of Yellowstone National Park. Um, these take a little bit different approach, more hands-on. You're going to have uh, people out with the cattle, frequently checking them, making sure that they're healthy. Some of the same similar things that we do with the sheep. Um, doing some hazing practices to keep the, the wolves at, uh, away from the cattle. And if using their natural fear of people um, seems to work pretty well. Meeting with the landowners has been just essential. Uh, getting to know the people personally, it, you can't do it any other way. Um, unfortunately, it's a lot of labor that goes into it, but that interpersonal communication of meeting people and looking them in the eye and listening to them is the key to success in, in terms of projects like these. A long way to go. Um, this map shows kind of the historic range. Uh, an occupied wolf range is in the dark green. Uh, their historical range is in the light green. And then what's left in terms of suitable habitat now for gray wolves is there in the red. And uh, right now, wolves are trying to make their way down. They're dispersers, so they can go hundreds of miles. We've had our first wolf go from central Idaho, um, which is right over here. Uh, set up camp over here and have a, a pack of wolves established here in Oregon. And then one of those wolves is his first already down into Northern California. Uh, his name is Journey. Traveled quite a long way. So they want to. I mean, the habitat is still there for them to be able to return. It's a matter of helping people learn how to live with them again on the landscape. These are our project partners that uh, we always recognize as we would not be able to do it without them. So, thank you.